Okay, maybe get started, huh? Yeah, let's get started. Yeah. Hi, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Ardavan Bakhtari. I'm the president of Centroid, and I have with me Omid. He is our director of R&D. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, so in this series of uh, webinars, our aim is to introduce some of the new technologies that we've been working on in the last year or so, and to kind of give the opportunity to uh, present it and give the opportunity for you guys to ask questions and dig deeper into any applications you may have. So the format of our presentation is going to be that Omid is going to give a technical presentation. Uh, Omid has been involved in the development of this particular technology, which is the DR2000, our um, flying laboratory, what we call, so our drone-based chemical analyzer. So Omid is going to do a technical introduction to the unit. I will fill in with some uh, explanation of the software and analysis tools that come with it. And you feel free to ask questions in the chat window, and we will read through the questions and answer them. Uh, so we just kind of queue up questions through the chat window. And you don't need to wait to the end of the presentation. Whenever it comes up, just put it in, and we kind of take some time in between slides to read those out. So uh, let's get started. I'll uh, hand it off to Omi to start our technical presentation. OK, uh, thanks, everyone, for joining in. Uh, um, so I'll be uh, introducing the new product we have, the DR2000. Um, I'm going to be uh, stopping after about each slide to uh, answer any questions in the chat. So please, uh, as soon as we have a question, just type it in, and then I'm going to get to that quick. Um, yeah, so just uh, just logistics. So you should be able to see three views here. So one is us showing us, and the other one is the slides, and the other one uh, is a camera showcasing our actual products sitting here on this table. Uh, so we'll be going back and forth a bit between these uh, today. Um, okay, without further ado, let's start the uh, presentation. So our DR2000 product is a successor of our previous product called DR1000. Uh, which are basically a flying laboratory, uh, which basically gets mounted on a drone, and then we fly them around uh, places of interest, and we measure pollutants and uh, parameters related to what we are interested in. So uh, I'm going to go over a few key points of uh, the R2000 and how it is improved. So the first and foremost is the weight reduction. So we heard from our customers that they're really struggling with the heaviness uh, of the DR1000 and how it limits their operating time. So what we did was we redesigned the whole thing from ground up and then we came up with a new weight of uh, 520 grams. So this is the base product, but fully loaded with all the sensors and everything, it can go up to 640 grams. So what this allows us to do is basically allows us to have a longer flight time. So that's a major benefit of this and also, um, this the product now can be mounted on much wider selection of drones, where previously it was only, we could only do it on a very professional high-end drones capable of handling the payload. So now we have a much wider uh, practical application of this. So the next thing is, uh, in this product, we're now using a LoRa communication protocol. And with this, we have a higher uh, throughput of data. So we're able to send back and forth uh, uh, data faster than before. And we also be able to get a longer range of this drone, which I'm going to talk about shortly, uh, what that is. Now, um, here at Centroid, we've developed new sensor boards. It's our own sensor boards here that we uh, um, researched and developed here uh, that basically work with the electrochemical sensors. Um, as we all know, the electrochemical sensors are challenging to work with, depending on their environmental conditions. Uh, but with this uh, new uh, sensor boards that we developed, we're able to have a much more accurate reading and also much more stable readings uh, from these sensors. So this is uh, the very first product that we are almost uh, including all these sensors inside. And uh, uh, this advancement allows us to have much more accurate readings at much higher, much lower level readings. So we're almost with certain sensors, we can get uh, almost PPB levels, uh, like 10 PPB level measurements with these. Now, as you can see here in the photo, we have this black casing at the bottom, and that is the DR2000 analyzer. And 
The material uh, is carbon fiber. So we went through a whole design iteration and the material selection choices to come up with a uh, design that is light and also that it is something that is durable and able to work with with the sensor. So this design is uh, more aerodynamic than before, allows us to fly more efficiently and also uh, it's much more durable as well. Now, here you can see the probe here on the photo. Uh, that's the sample intake probe uh, where the air flows in, uh, which provides the sample for both gases and also the particulate matter sensors which are all included inside the housing. Uh, unlike before, we were using a pump to take samples in. Uh, we're now using a fan to create a negative pressure inside the box. And the air flows in as a result very smoothly through this probe and flows across the sensors and out the system. So this way, we reduce the pulsation caused by pumps and therefore uh, we reduce the noise, noise drastically uh, from the sensors. Now, let me just get a question over here. Okay, so Jim is asking, can you highlight the laser on screen? Yes, definitely. Let me see if I can enable that. Um, okay. Is that over here? Yeah, I think it's spotlight, right? Okay. Yeah, no. Yeah. Here. Do you see? Do no. you see that one? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, perfect. No, good. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. So I was referring to this black box over here. So that's our analyzer, and then this is a sampling probe which is attached to the system. So uh, some of the advancement, as, as Omit was saying, through the use of the electronic, uh, the electronic new electronic board that we have, and through the way that we deliver the air to the sensor, it means that we can achieve for some sensors things that were before not possible uh, in this industry. For example, we can detect methane in uh, sub PPM levels and methane usually uh, with a compact gas sensor was well over like 50 or 20 PPM. So we can get into the PPP levels for methane uh, as well. And other sensors like H2S and SO2 and NO uh, below 10 PPP detection, uh, even ammonia, we can get down to PPB level detection, which was really rare. And that's why it opens up a lot of new uh, applications, which we'll talk about like in the electronic manufacturing, wafer manufacturing industry or uh, leak detection uh, because of these new advancements. Yeah, yeah, exactly, great. Um, so our next question is, what is the lag time between the tip of the tube and an actual reading? Um, so that's a great question, which leads us to the next slide where we're going to talk about the specifications of the product. But basically, um, the delay for that is very uh, small because the sample comes in at the rate of two liters per minute. So um, their sample reaches the sensors very fast and sensors have typically response time of uh, a few seconds. So uh, it's just a matter of seconds that the sensors will be responding. Yeah, so over here, I'm just gonna go over a few key points uh, of the specifications. I'm not gonna go over the whole thing. Uh, this is available on our website. Uh, I can go into more detail later on. Uh, but just to highlight for now, we are able to have 11 sensors in this unit. So including four electrochemical sensors, one CO2, one PID, one methane, one PM, which includes PM1, 2.5 and PM10, uh, temperature and relative humidity sensor, as well as a barometer for measuring the altitude and air pressure changes. So we can have all of these sensors uh, inside the unit at the same time, and that brings us to the maximum weight of the 640 grams I mentioned earlier. So this uh, takes samples of one per second, um, and then uh, it communicates with the ground station at every four seconds. So the probe length, this probe is actually detachable, so user can remove it or put stack more in case of, uh, uh, of a specific application, we can stack them in increments of 44 centimeters. Uh, this, this is the size of the product, which is uh, the largest is 23 centimeters, uh, which is much more smaller than before. And the total flight time of this unit uh, depends really on the drone which flies this product, but typically uh, with the DJI Inspire 2 drone that we tested, we get about 25 minutes of flight time. But the DR2000 product itself has a runtime of about two hours from a full charge uh, state. So 
if you want to operate more, you can have the drone land and then we can swap the batteries and quickly go back up in the air. So as I mentioned, these, the R2000 analyzer communicates with the ground station using LoRa communication. And then the ground station communicates with our cloud-based service, which I will talk later, uh, using the internet connection. But in terms of data, the data is being stored locally uh, inside the analyzer on SD card. Uh, that is by default. Uh, and also the data transfers to the ground station as well. So in case somebody wants to have an offline measurements all the time, this is possible with this unit. So with this product, we have, uh, we include access for one year to our dreams to uh, software and cloud server, which basically stands for drone information management system. That's where all the data analysis and the storage happens. We'll talk in detail about that later. The operating temperature and humidities are uh, five to 40 degrees and 10 to 90 percent. And of course, uh, uh, this product comes with our 24 month warranty for including all the parts and everything. So just skipping to the uh, end of this. Uh, so when you purchase a DR2000, it comes with a complete package of the DR2000 analyzer, the ground station receiver, the ground station itself, the air sampling pro, charging adapter, zeroing filter, and safety ties. Normally, by default, this doesn't include the drone itself, but that's an add-on option that we can add on top of your order to get the drone as well. Um, so in terms of the drone, this is the recommended drone that we uh, come up with from our testing. We found this to be the most suitable drone to operate with. This is not really an industrial grade, but more like a consumer grade, which is much more affordable. Um, and that was one of our design goals to push towards this. But this drone is very nice for this use because it has many safety features like collision avoidance in three directions and also functions such as return to home for low, low battery or signal loss uh, connections. But they yeah. don't have to buy this yeah, particular necessarily, drone. Yeah, this is just a recommendation. They don't really have, you don't have to buy this drone. Any drone that can handle the payload can deal with this. We just pick the most common drone, like 90% of sold drones are these. So this is the one we picked, but uh, feel free to select your own drone, uh, local manufacturer, as long as it can lift off that much weight, 600 yeah. grams. Yeah, exactly. Uh, a question just came in about this uh, topic, uh, which says, is the mounting position uh, able to be adjusted to calibrate center of gravity for the aircraft with different probes? Uh, so these probes are actually very light. They're also made from carbon fiber. So totally they weigh about uh, 25 grams. So it won't really affect the center of gravity by much. So that shouldn't be any problems. But in terms of mounting, this is uh, a customizable per order. So, uh, but by default, it comes with mounting for uh, Inspire 2 drone as well. Uh, which leads us to now to the drone. I'm just going to show you how the drone is uh, mounted on our drone over here. I'm just going to bring it over to the main camera so you can kind of see it in full screen. Okay. So this is the Inspire 2 drone. Uh, in front of it, we have the camera over here, which comes with the drone. So we can have in flight and live a view of where we're sampling. Uh, this is bottom of the drone, which includes some sensors for safety, collision avoidance, as well as the front sensors here for collision avoidance as well. So this is the lid of this product, which has mounting points here uh, for mounting the drone onto the Inspire 2. But it's very simple. It basically slides on to here, just like that. And then the rest of the DR2000 body uh, gets screwed in over here. So uh, it's quite practical and simple to put on as well. And then you can see in the front side that there are these safety hooks here as well. So uh, using zip ties, you can further have like redundancy here for safety as well for doing this flight. But we've designed this product so that it doesn't really interfere with the drone systems. So it doesn't block the camera's views or everything. So we have full functionality of the drone as well with this product. And when you install it on the, on the drone, mm -hmm. as you notice, there is no uh, connection of electrical or communication. So the drone uh, is not a communication interface for our system. Uh, the batteries, the communication, and uh, everything else is built into that box. So all the drone is doing is carrying it. And that's why we're saying it really doesn't matter which drone you own. 
So if you say I want to mount it on a Matris 600 or uh, some other manufacturer, so all we would do is provide you with a separate lid that would have mounting points to a Matris 600 or another drone. And you would just mount it like that. So it's possible to lift it with a balloon, to mount it on a car, to, to really do anything because it's a self-contained unit which has its own power and its own communication. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, so the drone itself, the analyzer itself, basically has a button on off switch and a charging port and an LED indicator in the front, which is actually visible from the drone's uh, feet during flight. Uh, but basically it's one step operation, you turn on the drone, and then here we have the ground station tablet here, uh, which has our own uh, uh, in-house developed software here. And in the back side, you can see the actual receiver mounted permanently on the case. So that's the ground station in total. So one person can operate this uh, without any uh, problem. Um, and here, this is the controller of the drone that comes with the drone. Uh, so the pilot of the drone will be operating this. Um, so realistically, um, uh, one person can operate the whole unit uh, uh, as well. So basically, you can set up the ground station and leave it aside and then use the controller to just fly the drone and then complete your sampling. But it would be re better recommended to have two people in case we want to have live analysis happen. Um, so in terms of the range of the drone, uh, we've had a lot of questions before about that. So the range we have now is about 1.5 kilometers. Um, and that's uh, almost three times that we could do before with the DR1000 product. That's right. Okay, Let's see if there's any more questions. Yeah. Yes, I have a question. Is there flying lab synchronized with drone functions like return to home? So um, we thought about this idea, but then we decided not to synchronize this just to uh, increase safety and also reliability of the product. Uh, so we don't want to really interfere with the drone's functionality. Um, so these are the two separate things. And uh, usually the pilot focuses on flying the drone and the ground station operator focuses on the DR2000 product. Um, yeah, we, we find that to be a better way of uh, operating the unit. Yeah, all those functions are available. They're just available on the separate tablet, not yeah. on the tablet that is used to view data from the analyzer. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay. So moving on, uh, I think it's a good point now to start talking about the dream. May, may I, sorry, may I have a question, please? Oh, yes, please, go ahead. Yeah, uh, the black box, which is uh, mounted uh, uh, on the drone from the bottom. And can, can you show me once again the inside uh, sensors? Uh, can, you, can I ask you to show me once again the sensors body inside of the black box? Inside. Yeah, yeah. No, inside. Uh, the sensors, you can't really see yeah. the sensors inside the box. You can see some of the electronics, but the sensors are in a separate compartment. Yeah, so the sensors are actually at the very bottom. Uh, they're integrated into a channel that is in front of the sampling port. So air flows across them, and then they come out of in the back where there's an exhaust here, as you can see. But, okay, yeah. okay, okay. The, the question, why, the reason why I'm asking this, uh, I, I just want to know exactly the consumption of the sensors when they are on, on the, in the air, they need some power, okay? So uh, when drone coming through the some points, okay, and measuring uh, the, exp uh, the air outside, I want to see in the software the points of measurements, okay? When it comes home on the earth, uh, how can I be sure that power battery let's say battery pack which is inside is powering all this stuff uh, include all sensors which right. the battery is enough in order to not lose the the data from the monitor you understand what i mean yes exactly that's a great question uh so actually um our ground station software which you can see a screenshot of it in the screen right now uh, uh, like, like a mobile phone okay okay exactly so it's an app that runs on any app android device and you can see here all the parameters of drone life. So it actually tells you the battery percentage remaining, uh, if you, when was the last time that you received the data packet, and everything is shown here. So if there's any problem communication or the battery loss, you will actually get an error message here indicating that life. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. The, the design of this uh, instrument is a single board design. So everything sitting on one board uh, with no wires going anywhere. So what, what that means is that the processor, the sensors and everything are on a single PCB and uh, you cannot lose power to the sensors without losing communication to the ground station, for example. Right? So if something goes wrong, everything should shut down. Uh, and it's also sending data every second. So you can see if you get abnormal readings of either no voltage or uh, under voltage, it will send faults. So it's continuously communicating with the ground station, everything that is happening to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also on the drone body itself, there is an LED indicator that is indicating if there's any error, error happening. So it's both color and also the flashing that signals if there's any problems. So while flying, you can actually use the, use the drone camera to see the device and see if it's working properly or not. And this would yeah. be like if you lose connection with the ground station, you'd look and say, oh, OK, it's flashing red. I guess the battery is, up, is done or um, some fault in communication. Yeah. OK. okay. Uh, one, one, one question. Can I ask you again? Sure, but it's a lot easier if you type because sometimes okay. we hear it. Okay, okay. <laughs> but, uh, but finish, please. Hello? Okay, I guess he's going to type. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Um, I just want to be sure that all sensors are uh, working and they are uh, can be switched on like uh, in, in the, into the PCB in order to have, uh, let's say, PID detector can be something happened to him and all electrochemical sensors are working perfect. So how can I be sure that all, to be sure that all sensors uh, are switched in okay and, uh, you know. But the, so the way that our um, new boards work is that they're not looking at a voltage that they get from the electrochemical. They're kind of talking to the electrochemical. They're, they're looking at the current going through it. They're looking at the voltage that it gives back. So if you don't plug in an electrochemical in there, the system will realize the current and the power consumption of it. So it will not provide you with a PPB readings uh, and you will see that it's a fault. Like uh, you will get no data reading from that sensor. So it, it has these kind of fault detection built in. If the sensor is not even responding properly, you will get uh, this fault detection. Before the flight, we also ask that the user uh, zero the instrument. So you put a filter in and it will go through a zeroing process. And in that you will see if the electrochemical has drifted uh, considerably or if the PID is not responding the system will realize this, uh, the voltage, the base voltage is not correct, or the system is not going to a proper zero and will provide you with a fault inside the tablet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thanks for the question. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Excuse me, what about the calibration of the sensor? Uh, yeah, Omit uh, yeah. was going to get to that, but the calibration of the sensor, so you have a zeroing calibration and then you have a span calibration. Mm -hmm. The system works with another product we have, which is the GD600. And uh, now that's not to say you need to do a span calibration before each flight, but whenever you do want to do that, let's say after every few months or if you're flying a lot every few weeks, you want to do a span check, it interfaces with the GD600, which is a dilution device. And you can calibrate by applying gases um, in a cylinder, like a certified uh, calibration gases. And the GD600 will administer the gas to the system and collect the information. So you can do a full span calibration using that product. Yeah. Great, okay, so uh, let's go ahead with the slides here. Uh, so now we're gonna talk about the whole uh, Dreams2 application, which we kind of talked about so far. Um, so the Dreams2 uh, uh, information management system is basically uh, responsible for receiving the data, displaying the data, and also um, saving a historical data for this. Uh, another function of this is to uh, have an analysis on board so the user can go back and analyze 
and see on the map live, see what areas were more polluted or not. So this software also has a cloud-based uh, module to it, which we're gonna go over as well. There's a question. What is the lifespan of the yeah. sensors? So each sensor yeah. has a different lifespan. Um, mm -hmm. So for our electrochemical sensors are warranted for two years. Some of them, depending on use, like if you continuously use them in a ground-based uh, system, it will be around one year, one and a half years where you need to change it. In a drone, they probably would last the full two years. Um, things like PID after 6,000, is it 6,000 hours? Yeah, something similar, yeah. 6,000 or 8,000, I have to look it up, but it comes to around six months of continuous use. They will need a new PID lamp. Uh, in a drone, these things will come up less because you're just not running it 24 hours a day, right? You, you might run it like 10 hours a month. So in this case, the sensor will last for sure 24 months until it's kind of shelf life expires and the PID will last probably 10 years if you clean it every now and then. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, great. Okay. Uh, so the first part of the Dreams 2 is the ground station where uh, it receives data from the analyzer and it analyzes on the app and also it uploads the data to our cloud-based solution. So the first thing about the ground station is, is it's a primary system for uh, the Center Flying Laboratory unit. Uh, it includes all the data as well as the historical data for the sensors, uh, which includes all the GPS and temporal uh, information that we collect during a flight. So uh, on this app, you're able to select or create a new project. And then uh, basically for each flight, you can create a new uh, section where you can also fly and then go back to and see where, what the data you collected uh, look like. Uh, so one of the major features of this app is it's that it's very simple to use. Basically, it's a plug and play. When you uh, hit the start record button, everything, all the checks and everything will be running automatically in the background. Um, with this app, you're able to see and set alarms here. As you can see, for example, the PID sensor here is showing in red. It's showing an alarm, which is also customizable. You can set your own levels for any alarm detection. And also you can perform routine maintenance such as the calibration of sensors and rezeroing as well. So it's like an all-in-one solution uh, for operator to use. So with this app, you're also able to do mapping, uh, especially heat mapping. So let's say you fly around a compost area which has a lot of pollutants. Uh, so on the map, actually, if you take a look, you're gonna have, you will be able to see like a heat map of the area showing that the pollution is in that level ever high. So you can actually select specific sensors like temperature, relative humidity to generate that heat map, heat map for. So one of the major benefits of this uh, mapping is that this is a three-dimensional map. So we can also actually tag the altitude that we flow at and then we can see uh, that as well in three dimensions. Now, the other part of this is the data analysis and graphing. Um, so we can also, instead of the visual map, you can also see a plot, like a temporal plot of this uh, as well, which is linked to our Dreams2 online project as well. But at the end of the flight, you can export the data in an Excel format or at any database format, and you can post the analysis, analyze them as well afterwards. So with that, I'm gonna uh, hand this to Erdogan, who's gonna talk about with you about the uh, online cloud-based software. Yeah, so um, I had more uh, development time on the cloud software, so I'm gonna explain that. The idea here is that the ground station is used to check the data for a single flight. So as you're flying, you look at it, it will give you alarms, it will sound the alarm when it, the threshold is gone, you can look at the plume, and you can use it to change your flight pattern or make sure everything's okay. Once you land or even while you're flying, the data is being streamed to our cloud-based software. And then the cloud-based software is collecting data from multiple flights, multiple drones, and is pulling all that data together to make for you some uh, useful conclusions. So, how it means, uh, I'm just going to look at a few things. We're not going to go too detail into the cloud-based because it has a lot of uh, 
features built in, uh, AI for detection of events and heat maps and things like that. So I think it would be outside the scope of this presentation, but we're gonna make another presentation for that. But I'm just gonna highlight a few things. So what it allows you to do are things like combine multiple flights to create a heat map. And that heat map, you can say, I want to see pollution, average pollution for a whole city for six months. And it will create a heat map for all the flights you have done for six months and combine them into the proper grid to create for you hotspots of where pollution has been happening. Or you can tell it, I want all exceedances that were detected within this area. And it will do something like that. Um, you can also use it to determine what were the peak events and in which flights. So that's our kind of our second one that you can see. So it's showing you a temporal graph as well as a point cloud based on that. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, you can make heat maps, but you can also have the data combined. So the heat map can be for a single uh, data sensor like H2S, for example, or it can be something like order where the cloud software takes all the data, combines them, based on an AI algorithm we have for each industry. So let's say you're doing a wastewater treatment plant or a landfill, it will use our landfill um, calibration to convert from the gases to an odor and then create a heat map based on an odor so you can see where the plume had been or which residents are being more subjected to the odorous compounds. Uh, it will also create for you PDF reports so it will kind of give you a um, status of what has been happening. So it will say for this flight, there was uh, six kilometers covered. Uh, that includes 20,000 data points. And the highest point was in this location. Here is the heat map. Here is the temporal graph and uh, things like that. So it has a predefined format and it will kind of fill in the data for you. So we've been trying to make it uh, so easy so that you don't really need to do any post-processing. So you don't need to take it to another GIS software and manipulate the data. It will do everything for you within the dream software. You can still use another like ArcGIS or anything else and the data can be exported in uh, a format that is accepted by ArcGIS and other software. But we find that most clients won't even need to do that because the software already has that uh, GIS built in. Oh, great. Yeah. All right, so now are we going to talk about the little of, uh, applications here? If there are no questions. Um, okay, so the first application here is uh, the urban uh, air pollution measurements. So we're really interested to measure to see how much pollutant here is around us during our everyday lives. But as you can imagine, it can be very challenging at times to measure uh, street level or like local level of pollutants just because it's difficult to reach those areas. So our drone like, uh, is capable of reaching those areas uh, because it's a light drone as well. So it's kind of more safer to fly around in those settings. Um, but with this, we can actually measure real time uh, concentration of these pollutants and we can have uh, those information as well. So the ultimate goal is to uh, identify the sources of this and also reduce these pollutants uh, in our own cities. If I can just add to that. Yeah. Uh, like we had one client use it in the Middle East to determine the inversion layer of the city. Uh, they were concerned with smog. So they were monitoring certain compounds and flying vertically up until they get to that inversion layer. And this way we could map out temperature versus height, uh, as well as other pollutants uh, like PM and NOx and other things that they were interested in, in mapping and the map kind of gives you that 3D point cloud. So it was very easy to see where the inversion layer was happening. Yeah, great. Now, next application, which has a lot of interest is the wastewater treatment plants. Uh, one of the prominent issues with this is that these plants produce a lot of uh, odorous gases. Uh, so we would want to be able to measure these things. So uh, for each application, we recommend certain sensor configurations. So for example, here, recommend an H2S, DMS, and other sulfur compounds, gases like SO2. So with this in the drone, we can actually fly around and see where the plumes of these holders are going and uh, which areas of the community these are affecting as well. 
Uh, another interesting application here is a pipeline leak detection and also in oil and gas industry, uh, where we're interested to see uh, in real time or as quick as possible to see where the leaks are and what the severity of the leak is. Uh, so with the drone, we're able to quickly get to the site and fly over the pipes and identify with a quick response time to see uh, where the leak is happening and then quickly send the unit to uh, uh, deal with the leak as uh, there. So because of the regularity of this uh, need that we need to check these uh, on almost everyday basis, uh, uh, having a drone fly around is much more practical than having a person going around on the ground to do this. Uh, another thing is co about compost. Uh, so uh, as you can imagine, there's a lot of biological risks and chemicals uh, released by these uh, facilities. So it's very important to uh, monitor these things around, uh, uh, assess their impacts on our everyday lives. So uh, one of the interesting things with this is uh, the wind direction changes often. And so the plumes of these travel in different directions and different ways. So we really can utilize this drone to fly around and kind of uh, trace these uh, plumes as they travel in the atmosphere to try to see where they are going to and what their impacts are. Also for yeah. uh, release of biogas like methane from a landfill or a compost site, um, because as we mentioned before, we worked a lot on the methane sensor and got it to be self PPM level detection. And it's a very fast sensor. It's uh, easy to now fly the drone in a grid pattern over a huge landfill and without having to drive over it or walk all over the landfill, you're able to map out the entire landfill and all that is done automatically. So uh, in cases we have clients that have set the flight pattern on the drone. So on this, on this drone, you can do that. So you just allow it to go in this zigzag pattern through the whole compost field. And then you just look at the map that is being generated and right away, you know where the hotspots are. Uh, another great application of this is uh, for first responders. So here we're showing an example of a forest fire and wildfire burning. Uh, and so it is very crucial for uh, the first responders to know where they should focus their effort and uh, send their help to work. So with this drone, we can quickly get to the site and measure uh, where the fire is progressing or what the severity of it is and where it started and all of that. So with that, we can really focus all the uh, firefighting activities toward that area. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Any There's a point? question. Yeah. Um, how long does one flight last? Yeah, so, so each flight lasts uh, about 25 minutes with the DJI Inspire 2 drone. But for example, if you use another drone which has a higher um, flight time, then our device can go up to two hours of continuous use where it would need recharging. And the recharging of the drone is uh, very quick. It's in half an hour or 40 minutes, you can get up to 80% of its charge back. And full charge would take about around 50 minutes. For uh, the analyzer. For the analyzer itself, yeah. The drone itself has a separate battery and a separate charger. Uh, so the drone, uh, the Inspire 2 drone takes about an hour for it to charge back up again. Can, can you sample for odors instead of specific chemicals? So. Odors, um, so how we measure odor can be in two different ways. One is based on chemicals. So we do need to measure specific chemicals, but we do have algorithms that tie that chemical to a total odor concentration. So it's an estimation of what the odor strengths will be. Uh, the alternative is to measure using a human nose. And we also work in that direction, but you really can't do that on a drone. So on a drone, we do measure specific compounds, but we can tie it back to the other concentration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, next question from Beyond says, how is the weather like a high temperature and high wind can affect the flight period? Uh, so the flight period is really dependent on a specific drone. Um, so this specific drone that we have is rated to operate within its temperature and um, temperature ranges, which is from negative 20 to 45 degrees, I believe. So uh, we can expect the full operating time in those conditions. Although the high wind, there is a limit on the uh, wind speed, which is about 10 to 11 meters per second, uh, which a drone shouldn't really fly uh, above that speed. But of course, higher wind speed uh, results in lower flight time. So in a very windy conditions that we tested so far, we saw a drop of about four to five minutes maximum. So it's not really a big uh, drop. Given yeah. the response time of some of these sensors, 
how long would you need to hover in a location to be certain you are getting a good state? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. So um, the sensor's response times are very quick, so it's about a few seconds. Um, so the drone itself sends the information to the ground station every four seconds. So depending on how accurate you want the reading to be, you can stay hover there longer, but at minimum, I would say about eight to 16 seconds is uh, much more suffi sufficient to get what you need. Um, so there's two ways to also sample. You can just slowly keep moving. Um, you know, if you're just looking for a hotspot, if you keep going at a slower speed, let's say like uh, one or two meters per second, uh, you don't really need to hover. But if you're doing a grid pattern on top of, somewhere uh, and you want to have then yeah like maybe 18 seconds you would get uh you know you get these one second sample but just they're transmitting every four seconds yeah. next question is can you discuss the business case uh price per flight project specific hourly rate with metrics to clients uh, maybe uh yeah so i don't know we have a lot of international clients so we don't really have it Good idea how much it costs for example in israel or in dubai or chile to to fly the drones uh if after the presentation you email us we can provide you with a code for the drone itself the analyzer that we sell and then after that you just need the pilot there is no running cost there's no consumables except sensors okay after the two-year period there is no really like every flight costs you this much in consumables. It's just going to be your labor and the initial investment into the drone and the analyzer. Yeah, and of course, uh, access to our Dreams 2 software is included with this. So that's not like a running cost that you would experience in the first yeah, year. Yeah, exactly. Um, and a sensor measurement stability. So uh, for each sensor, we have published accuracy, uh, lower detection limits, range, and everything we've done a lot of improvements on the sensor stability uh, so we can share with you some of the findings uh, that third party uh, like universities have done comparing our our instrument against other electrochemicals and uh, you will see that the you know when they compare to a station for example no2 uh, or ozone compared to a full station us epa station we're getting R squared values, the comparison between the two being like 96%. And this is in the low PPB level, like from three to 15 PPB, 20 PPB, mm -hmm. right? And, and we're seeing the same kind of trend in an analyzer as we see in our station, in our sensors in the 15 PPB range, which is really amazing. Yeah, also like uh, customers are able to fly these drones uh, and stand near a uh, red, like a uh, air quality station in the city and also kind of verify their drone as well that's also a possibility here as well yeah uh, when we sell the drone it comes with a calibration certificate which is basically that's what we do we put them in a chamber and we have a rack of analyzers and we compare the two that's our final qc and uh, when you get the drone you get the certificate as well that shows this so every drone kind of goes through that verification anyway yeah exactly uh, next question is, uh, is that city technology production? No. No, I don't know what city technology production is, but no, yes. it's a centroid technology. <laughs> yes, produced here. <laughs> so it's produced here. Uh, the sensor, electrochemical sensor itself, some of them are custom made for us. Uh, some of them are um, that we get from our manufacturers, but what really has taken it to another level has been the electronics that we have developed. So it, we don't just take a voltage and amplify it, something like that. So it's, it's a whole new way of looking at electrochemical signal and uh, another way of calibrating uh, using AI for uh, offsets and things like that. So it, it has taken to another kind of level from what has been in, used in the industry. And we are presenting the first of the products that are using this technology, but we'll see our other products uh, in the next few months in air quality, indoor air quality, portable handheld analyzers that are uh, utilizing the same advancement. Yeah. Uh, and the next question is, can you offer cloud partitions that meet government security stack? Um, so yeah, you can maybe comment on that about the yeah, so, uh, yeah, so we do run, and so everything we have 
is to have a very secure channel from one end to the next. So from the drone, the data that is being sent to the ground station is uh, encrypted. So it's a LoRa encryption and you cannot kind of sniff that, that transmission. And then data is encrypted when it's in the, in the tablet. And then when it's sending it to the cloud station, our cloud station is, um, I can look up the security of how it is, uh, but I know we put a lot of security and encryption on our cloud security system. But if you mean like it needs to be in Azure or in another cloud server, um, we can create a custom made one if necessary. Uh, or you can opt to not use that at all. And just, you know, in some cases where we had clients that don't want their data going out at all, so it just stays on the tablet, so from the drone to the tablet, and that's all. Okay. Uh, where's the last one? Yeah, I think it's this. Yeah, we use Gravewolf handheld and have a set of schedule per sample. Uh, oh, okay. So the idea is if you're considering the difference between running a drone versus running a handheld analyzer. And it, the application is a wastewater treatment plant. Yeah, so a wastewater treatment plant, what would be the difference? Yeah, it's a, it's a huge difference between the two. Uh, in terms of cost, again, it's hard for me to tell because I don't know what labor costs are in your area, but even not considering labor costs, let's say in a wastewater treatment plant, you have a complaint if you can get a drone to that complaint web, the complaint site of a neighboring residence within two minutes, you have a chance to collect information about that actual event. If somebody has to get in their car, drive over, turn on their analyzer, sample the data and come back, most likely you're gonna miss that data anyway. So it's mm -hmm. gonna be more about the amount of area you're gonna cover, uh, the vertical, uh, you know, it might be that right at your boundary, there is no smell if you're just standing under the fence because the odors are kind of going up and then coming down somewhere else. But if you take a vertical profile at your boundary downwind from your plant, you might see that at 600 meters or 200 meters, you're gonna have a stronger odor, maybe even 50 meters from your uh, fence, you're going to get that odor. So you kind of can get that vertical boundary of the odor plume going over. So these are going to be more the advantages that cost, um, I guess, that the pilot and the person walking around would be the same. I, I imagine it's faster to do it by a drone, but yeah, I, don't, I can't do a particular cost analysis without knowing labor charges. Yeah, exactly. And also here, as you can see on the screen, we had a case study uh, which done by police in, uh, in Poland. Uh, so where local authorities use this drone, as you can see, it's a DR1000 DR unit shown here, um, which we used to actually uh, figure out where the smog uh, sources were. Um, yes, yeah, so th this was an interesting one. So they, it led to the first uh, ticket being issued in Europe for uh, burning of illegal fuel for house um, heating. So it was, they were burning uh, construction waste, wood and something like this. And uh, the police would uh, identify houses, go over them with a drone. And the good thing was they didn't need to you know, get a permit and climb somebody's roof. So they were just going through the smoke that was getting out of people's houses and checking for certain kind of like, um, uh, right now yeah. I cannot think of the exact sensors that was there, um, but uh, things that are released when you burn wood that is with glue, that is with paint, things like that. And what they would get is if they get a reading, high reading, then they could get a permit to go in and check what they're burning in their stoves. So, and then, then uh, we have some very nice video the police itself made uh, where they go and arrest the guy because he was burning illegal fuel and it's kind of cool to watch them enter. Uh, they also put these on top of their police car, so it's 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 a nice video of uh, of the police enforcing air quality restrictions using drones. Yeah. Okay. So, is there any other questions? Uh, is there any questions? We're open for discussion here. If you guys wanna uh, ask any more? Yeah. Okay. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay.
All right, so it may come up that in 10 minutes or in a few days, you may come up with some questions or applications that you'd like to discuss. We're open to and always available. So if you just email info at centroid.com, uh, you can reach us and we'll be happy to answer all those questions. Uh, we're also going to send you some information regarding you know, the brochure for the drone, for the cloud-based software. And uh, we thank you so much for joining us. And we hope to see you on our next webinar regarding another product. Yeah, thank you all for joining and uh, sending for us today. Yeah. Oh, there is one question. Which sensors can be oh. used for a chemical plant monitoring? But uh, depends on the chemical plant, I guess, uh, for petrochemical or for other chemicals. But we do have a list for almost every industry. So if you email us, we can send you that list. And it's quite easy to look. You just look up your industry and it tells you right away what sensors you should use. Right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Ciao. Uh, this is Jim Fitzgerald. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See you.